So in the previous lecture segment, we looked at conjugation as one mechanism for generating bacteria that have recombinant chromosomes, recombinations of alleles on those chromosomes. The next process that can create recombinant bacterial cells is called transformation. You'll remember that in conjugation, the two cells were both alive and there was a pillus that formed between them and the DNA was able to travel across that pillus. In transformation, the donor cell has to be dead. So the donor cell dies at some point. The D DNA from that cell is released into the environment. So you have either a fully circular molecule or just a fragment of um, a bacterial chromosome. And we call that the free naked DNA. And then you have recipient cells, which we call the competent cells. So what will happen is the DNA that was released from a dead or a dying um, cell, once it's released, it then can be pulled into a competent cell. The way we do that is either through heat shock or electric shock. If you mix the naked DNA with the live competent cells, and then you heat shock or electric shock the mixture, you can cause the DNA to become taken into the bacterial cell. So the DNA somehow gets past the cell membrane in the cell wall and ends up inside the cell. And that can change the recipient's genotype and phenotype if the piece of donor DNA that comes into the cell differs at some alleles and if that piece of DNA can be integrated onto the recipient's chromosome. So this shows the basic process of transformation, a schematic of the process. You have some type of naked free DNA, shown here in red. During a heat shock or electric shock, one of the two strands of that DNA is able to enter into the cell, into the cytoplasm. If there's a cr double crossover event that incorporates that piece onto the recipient cell's chromosome, then that piece of DNA can become a permanent part of the genome. But what's interesting is it's only on one of the two strands of the double-stranded chromosome. So when that cell divides, only one of the two daughter cells, and therefore only half of all of the descendant cells, will carry that recombined allele. But still, we get some recombined, some recombinant cells. So sometimes we call those the transformants. The bacterium Escherichia coli is one of our model organisms, and there is a brief overview of some of the critical facts about E. coli. Basically, E. coli is um, the only model organism on our list that is prokaryotic. And the contributions to genetics are very basic. So you want to focus on like just the very basic stuff, the molecular biology and biochemistry of all genetic processes, such as DNA replication, transcription, translation, recombination. Those are really important. Most of the things that we've learned about DNA replication and transcription and translation and recombination come from studies that are first done in bacteria and then we move to eukaryotic models and see you know what the similarities are and usually it's very similar in the eukaryotes so we've learned a lot of our basic knowledge about genetic processes first in bac using bacteria as the model now, there is one more way that bacteria can become recombinant. So transformation, which is just free naked DNA that gets pulled into a cell and then recombines onto the chromosome. Conjugation, which is a, an actual direct transfer between living cells, but then that DNA has to get incorporated into the recipient cell. And then virus. Virus can be a vector, which is a way that DNA can be transferred between cells. 
Specifically, what we're going to talk about are bacteriophage, which is a type of virus that infects bacterial cells. So somehow I find it kind of comforting that even bacterial cells can get infected with a virus. But they have their own specific viruses that target them, and they're called bacteriophage, or just phage for short. Now the type of phage that we'll be talking about have a life cycle that's shown here called the lytic life cycle. And what a phage really is, let me go back one, this is a phage, it looks a little like some kind of alien spaceship. And it has this headpiece here, and then it has this long trunk, and then these leg-like extensions. And this is all made of protein. And then what's inside of this head would be a chromosome. In bacteriophage, it's usually going to be a DNA chromosome. And it's usually going to be a linear piece of DNA. So the typical structure for a bacteriophage is protein on all the structural components and then a, a chromosome inside this headpiece. And so what happens is when a phage lands on the outer surface of a host cell, of a bacterial cell, it injects the DNA through the cell wall and cell membrane into the cell. This, the phage chromosome has genes which have regulatory components that cause them to be expressed very quickly such to create the production of the viral proteins very quickly and they take over the cell and one way that they take over the cell is that the phage brings in a gene that encodes an enzyme that cuts up the host cell chromosome. So when the phage first injects its DNA into the host there's a little bit of a battle that goes on in the sense that the host cell has enzymes in its cytoplasm that should be able to break up the phage DNA to prevent the infection. So that does happen quite a bit. But once in a while you do get phage that are able to somehow not get, not have their DNA broken up by the um, enzymes in the host cell. And if that is able, if that chromosome is able to survive long enough, it can express its genes and produce its own enzyme that actually breaks up the host cell chromosome. So that's what you're seeing here on step three in the red. So once that happens, then the phage chromosome will be replicated, the phage protein components will be made in the cell, and then once there are, oh, could be millions of phage progeny constructed and assembled in the cell, the cell will lyse to release each of these new progeny phage. Each progeny phage can go out and then infect a new host cell. So very quickly you can get a phage infection spreading in a culture of host cells. So this is called the lytic cycle because it ends in the lysis of the host cell. And this is something that happens you know, when a phage meets a bacterial cell and in of itself it doesn't cause any transfer you know normally it doesn't cause any transfer of genes to happen but it can if there's a mistake during the process okay so this slide says once a phage infects a cell it replicates inside that cell and then lyses the cell the progeny phage infect the nearby cells and the killing continues. If you plate out some host cells on a plate with some phage that have been mixed in with the host cells, what you'll see on an auger plate will be these little clearing zones, these little killing zones. Each little killing zone is a clear spot on the lawn of bacterial growth that shows where one phage has infected initially one cell and then nearby cells and killed the cells. And so you can put a toothpick into the middle of these plaques, which is what each of these clear spots are called, and you can pick up phage on your toothpick. So if you stab a toothpick right into the middle of that plaque, you'll get phage on your toothpick, although it's invisible to the naked eye. So we grow, we can grow phage on a, uh, an auger plate.
in that way. But what happens in order for this process, in order for this phage infection to cause any kind of recombinate chromosomes to form, there has to be a mistake that happens. And the mistake that happens that leads to a recombined bacterial chromosome is called transduction. So transduction is our third method, our third mechanism of generating bacterial recombinants. And the way that happens is that during the, the lytic life cycle, if, remember, some of those bacterial chromosome pieces might be hanging around when the phage, the new phage progeny are being assembled, if accidentally you get a new phage protein um, component and then it incorporates a piece of the bacterial chromosome. So here in this picture you can see there's a piece of red chromosome which is really bacterial chromosome that accidentally got encased or assembled into a phage head. If that happens, it doesn't happen very much, but if it happens then that phage will go out and find a recipient cell and infect it, but it won't really infect it because it'll inject in that bacterial DNA which doesn't take over the cell, it doesn't cause infection, but it can recombine onto the host cell's chromosome and if there's different alleles on the red piece of DNA than on the green piece of DNA then you can get a recombination of alleles, a new combination of alleles. So that's called transduction where a phage carries a piece of DNA from one cell to another and you can get a recombination. So that really is the end of our discussion on how DNA recombination, how chromosome recombination can happen between bacterial cells. So make sure you know the definitions of those processes, the conjugation, the um, transformation, and the transduction. Make sure you know those processes. The rest of the, the chapter focuses on some interesting topics of viruses that are um, really eukaryotic viruses. So since we're talking about bacteriophage viruses, let's talk a little bit about viruses that infect eukaryotic cells. And one that you've probably heard of is called a retrovirus. A retrovirus is an RNA virus. That means that inside the protein um, coat you have an RNA molecule as the, the chromosomal DNA. And in eukaryotic uh, viruses often you have the purple here is the protein just like it was for the phage. But then you have um, some protein, you have a membrane like structure, okay, the viral envelope and the viral glycoproteins. So you have kind of almost a plasma membrane type structure surrounding the protein encapsulated RNA. So it's a, it's, it's a bigger particle and it has some lipid um, parts of it as well. And the most, um, well one of the uh, more studied retroviruses at this point is HIV. And HIV, the way it infects the cell, it doesn't just inject its DNA into the cell like a phage does. It it has these glycoproteins on its surface that bind to receptors on the white blood cell. So if this was HIV this would be a white blood cell and that causes the cell to be brought into, uh, excuse me, that causes the virus to be brought into the cell. And then what happens once the virus gets into the cell, that RNA molecule gets into the cell. The RNA molecule is then copied into a double-stranded molecule. One strand is still the RNA, it acts as a template, and the copy is actually DNA. And this is called reverse transcription because an RNA template is copied into a DNA product. And then once that DNA molecule is made, then the second strand of that molecule can be made and you end up with a double-stranded DNA copy of that original single-stranded RNA chromosome from the virus. And that can integrate into the host cell's chromosomes. But it can also be expressed, the genes on this DNA molecule can be expressed to produce, to cause the assembly of new viruses. 
So unlike the phage, the lytic cycle of phage, where the host cell is killed at the end of the cycle, what HIV does is allows the cell to live and just keeps churning out new virus particles. Once it's infected, it just keeps making new virus particles. So it's especially, you know, evil in terms of a virus. Or if you're looking at it from the virus's point of view, it's genius. So it, it, it's very successful in creating infection and spreading infection and maintaining infection. Um, but any case, we will be talking about a genetic resistance to HIV a little later in the course. And people who have a genetic um, resistance to HIV are missing this little purple receptor. They don't have the, uh, the gene for that purple receptor is, is mutated and they can't produce that purple receptor so they have a natural resistance. They cannot get HIV. So that's kind of interesting. Also in this chapter there's some discussion on how HIV can recombine, how viruses can recombine with each other, and the way a viral chromosome can recombine with another viral chromosome of the same type is only if both viruses co-infect a single cell. So both viruses would have to enter the same cell and then there could be some recombination and generation of some new recombinant progeny viruses. And that's actually how they think that the HIV virus was able to move from the primates, which include the monkeys, and chimpanzee is not a monkey, but it's related to monkeys. So the primates ha already have this virus. It's, it's fairly common. It's called SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus. And a lot of these monkeys have this. It's fairly endemic. But what they think happened is that, um, and, and, you know, it's hard to say if it only happened once or more than once, that a chimpanzee apparently was doubly infected by both a red-capped mangabe version of the virus and a great, greater spot-nosed monkey version, so two slightly different versions. There was some recombination that created what they called the chimpanzee version. And then the chimpanzee version was transferred to human through some kind of chimp to human contact. And because chimpanzee and human have enough similarity in evolution molecularly, they have enough similarity, the virus was able to infect the human cells. So, it's, you know, and they think maybe there were separate events where the virus was transferred to different humans. So it's kind of an interesting. Um, study. In, in a similar way, that's how the um, swine flu, um, the swine flu, the bird flu, and the human flu are all really similar. And they believe that sometimes these flu viruses can co infect an organism, whether it's a bird, a pig, or a human. For whatever reason, they're, they have a reasonable. Um, they have some chance of being able to co-infect some of the cells and you end up with these recombined viruses. So like when we talk about H1N1, you may remember that. That's referring to a specific combination of segments um, in the flu virus. The flu virus has eight segments for its genome. So you can get recombinations of virus if di slightly different viruses co-infect the same host cell and then get re recombined and repackaged. So that's the end of chapter seven. We took a kind of a shortened view of it, but make sure you know a little bit about each of those topics um, and, and those mechanisms.